All right, we're going to get started here tonight. We want to be in prayer for one another. I covet your prayers. I'll be headed to West Virginia in the morning and uh, going to preach at the church homecoming on the little dirt road of Elk Lake, West Virginia, a church I grew up in. And um, so I'm looking forward to that. I, I think I spoke on their 50th anniversary, and now I'm getting uh, and I, and Honestly, the pastor that's there now has me speak quite frequently. I appreciate him doing that but um it's just kind of good to go back home of course you know these are people most of them many of them that the older ones now <laughs> i'm one of the older ones <laughs> and uh, we all grew up together and then the rest of mo many of them are my cousins so anyway i'm looking forward to that just keep me in your prayers as i travel and um and son's going with me so keep her in your prayers because it's a long way from the VA or Piedmont or anything else around here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a long way from everything. But um, maybe you're here tonight and you have a special need. You just want to say, Lord, you know my need. Remember? Pray for Miss Terry. Uh, all of her, her MRI things that she took, make sure the, the test, everything is good. That's Amen. what we want. We, got, we was able to read a little bit of it, but we couldn't understand the words. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, we just prayed that. All right. It sounds better than what I looked up. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Well, the Lord knows our needs. Let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm sure some other will join us as, as we go along. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, God. Thank you for your word. We thank you that we're able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. And Lord, join our faith together, knowing that when we come together in the name of Jesus, you're right there. And Lord, we know that you hear and answer prayers. And Lord, we have testimonies, God, of so many people that you've touched and healed. And Lord God, I just pray that you would just continue to minister in the lives of people. For Sister Terry, Lord, continue to touch her. We pray for a good report from the tests that are done. And Lord, I pray for traveling mercies as I travel to West Virginia and back. And God, I pray for each of the ones that are here. And that God, that Sunday will be a great day in the Lord and that you will anoint Alicia to bring the word in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Alicia is in Cleveland with the youth doing the teen talent. I don't have any kind of updates. I don't know if they've, if our two have competed just yet, but um, <clears throat> I'm believing that they'll get high marks as well and represent us uh, in the North Georgia. They're not just representing Conyers Church of God, they're representing the Church of God in North Georgia. So I believe that's going to be a great outcome there. Well, we want to pick up on Article 3, and it's a, it's, I think it's the largest of the articles in the Declaration of Faith. And I'm going to just probably cover the first half of it. Next week, Brother Register will be uh, teaching on the second half of that particular article. I'm going to deal with um, uh, where it says, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, that Jesus was crucified. And uh, Brother Register is going to handle, um, ra well, maybe buried and raised from the dead. I think buried and raised go together. <laughs> I, I'm going through the crucifixion tonight. So he'll handle the second half of that particular article. But we want to... Uh, to look at that, and I will say, I haven't done this with the other ones, but uh, in one of the books I have, it lists many, uh, not all of the verses, but many of the strong verses that support a particular article uh, in the Declaration of Faith, and if it wasn't to based upon the Word of God, then I wouldn't support it. <laughs> I wouldn't be in the Church of God. So uh, we believe that there is biblical support for every one of the articles in the Declaration of Faith, and uh I just, I'm just showing you this. We're going to cover, we might hit on a couple of them as we go along. But I just want you to be aware that we strongly believe in each of these that we have good, strong scriptural support. And, um, and so we can have confidence. And oh, I forgot to bring a book down that I meant to bring down, but it, it's not important. But in support of this article, we need to remember, first of all, and I mentioned this last week when we talked about the Trinity or the Godhead, uh, the triunity of God, um, that John chapter 1, verses 1 
and two, give us strong support for the idea that, that Jesus is in fact deity, very God, and that he is not, that he is distinguishable from the Father. So in the beginning was the word, Logos, and the Logos was with Theos, actually, uh, te Theos, or it has the definite article there, you don't see it in English, but was with the God, and the word was God. And so you have him being God, but also being with God. And that word with, pros, meaning like uh, like face-to-face -face with, or being in the presence of, being with, in relationship with God. And he was in the beginning with God. I guess that should say John 1 through 3. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And I mentioned last week how that this refutes the the Jehovah Witnesses claim that Jesus is the first created being. The first thing that God created was Jesus, whom they say is an archangel. And um, like God with a little g, but not God Almighty, which is their phrase, God Almighty. Uh, so, and then down in verse 14, it continues. So the reason we know when it says the word here, the reason we know that he's talking about Jesus is because in verse 14 he says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so the word Jesus became flesh he was God he became flesh if you think in Philippians chapter 2 and I will re refer to that um, coming up but you have what's called the Christ hymn. It says, who being in the form of God, and King James, New King James says, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, thought it not something to be held on to, to be equal with God. He was God, but he voluntarily surrendered uh, the use of his independent attributes in order to take on the form of human humanity or human flesh. And I'll break down some of those words for you as we go along. But I just want us to see this, the word became the word was God always was God was with God the word became flesh Jesus became flesh it's interesting when you read and I was just going through a few of my uh, theology books um, that the early church never really debated the deity of Jesus so much the thing that really came into debate under something called doceticism and later it was called Gnosticism was the humanity of Jesus. They felt that the deity of Jesus, the proofs of the deity of Jesus, his miracles, uh, forgiving sin, the things Jesus did that affirmed his deity were so strong that they, they couldn't deny that, but they had a struggle with understanding how he could be human and be deity. Because in a what's called a dualistic uh, philosophy, material is bad, spirit is good. So... God is spirit, the Bible says that, and he's all good, and we are spirits trapped in evil bodies, and the goal, according to the, the dualist or the do, docetist, or, is for our spirit to be released from these evil bodies and reunited with the spirit of God, like a, like a smoke, like a puff of smoke joining the bigger puff of smoke. And so they don't really believe in the physical reality or humanity of Jesus, so they said Jesus, docetism uh, means appears. He only appeared to be human. He was God. He appeared to be human, but he wasn't human. Blake? Well, I don't want to get off topic into a little bit off topic. The way you said, like, so like smoke, basically. Um, when my grandma passed away, um, we had a lady named Mercedes. She, like, loved that lady. Like, that was her favorite work or whatever. And the way my grandma passed away, she was basically just, like, laying down. She was just, like, <sighs> for, like, hours and hours and hours. She said, like, the lady said, she was, it was basically just, like, them going, like, like where it doesn't hurt. Like, I don't know, their body, their breath is the last thing to leave or something like that. Yeah. And it's kind of like that. I think of it like that, like, slowly, slowly, slowly. Just like, like well, I've been with people many times when they've passed, and there's just this, this last exhale. Yeah. And it talks about Jesus on the cross where when he died, he gave up the ghost. 
And the word for spirit means breath, wind, spirit. That's both Ruach in the Old Testament and Numa in the New Testament. And uh, But um, when it talks about the spirit of man, uh, the Bible clearly indicates that Jesus was, in fact, fully human. Uh, my Bible's on my phone, so I can't use it. Uh, but if you look in, so John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then if you go to First John, the epistle, chapter 1, verse 1, John is going to say again, he said, that which we have seen with our own eyes, which we heard with our own ears, which we touched and handled and examined, this Jesus we declare unto you. He's saying he was really a man. We touched him, we heard him, we saw him, and this is the one we declare. And if anybody declares any other Jesus, they're a liar. And he, he in fact, he used that very word a couple times. They're a liar. And um, so Jesus definitely, so all the evidence is Jesus was definitely deity, but all the evidence was also that Jesus was flesh and blood as he dwelt among us. And that's the tension. That's the the issue that people struggle with. Well, let's, before we delve into that, let's kind of back up a little bit into what the statement says, that we believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father. And certainly he is the uniquely begotten Son of the Father. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And there's a sense in which Jesus is the Son of God in a way that none of us are. And we'll, again, we're going to move into that in a minute, but let's just you know, put that aside while we look at this and think about the concept of the Father. So John 1.1 1, 1 teaches that the word Jesus was with God and was God, and Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of God. So Jesus, the Son of God, did not come into existence in, in, in a stable in Bethlehem. Jesus pre-existed that, and... Uh, and we'll show you where he says that himself. So, but focus on the father there for a moment. He's the begotten son of the father. That word father is important. Um, there are some people that want to change it to parent. The, the parent, the de, you know, the God, the parent. Uh, but the Bible says father. It says it in the Old Testament. It says it in the New Testament. It says he's father, father God. And um, so I don't think we're at liberty to just change it. Some want to say mother God. Some say you can say mother or father. It doesn't really matter. Well, it matters if you want to follow what the Bible says, and the Bible says father. So <laughs> we had a, a long discussion and debate at the last General Assembly in the Church of God, and the ministers all affirmed, the ordained bishops affirmed that we're going to stick to the biblical definition of God as father and him and he, because that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. So think of Father God, and uh, he is in an eternal relationship with the Son of God. So if God is eternal, and the Son's eternally begotten of the Father, that relationship has always existed. I mentioned last week the concept of love. Love doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in a relationship. The Bible says God is love. God is eternal. So there has to be this eternal relationship where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's that relationship in which love can manifest. There was never a time when the Son did not exist. There was a time prior to the earthly existence of the historical Jesus but God the Son existed prior to him taking on or becoming flesh. So to become flesh, you had to have been something before flesh, right? So you had to, had to have the form of God and took on the form of sinful flesh, who being very God, took on the form of flesh. And so when we think about the Father, though, Jesus speaks of himself existing before Abraham. So this idea that uh, Jesus Christ did not exist as the Son of God prior to being born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus said to the Pharisees, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And he uses the Greek term, ego eimi, 
<clears throat> which means I am. He uses that frequently. In fact, in John's gospel, there are seven distinct places. Seven's an important number in the Bible. It means completion, fulfillment. And uh, he calls himself, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the gate. There's seven of those. I am the bread of life. Yes, sir. It's just the. I've never heard that before. Really? Well, they, God in His Word uses numbers for different things. So uh, you remember God created the heavens and the earth. Actually, in six days, in the seventh day, He rested, but seven days total for the account of creation, and uh, including the day of rest, which He incorporates then back into our worship of Him. And. Um, so it was completed, and so then that 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 paradigm that 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 paradigm that that I don't know if I call it a metaphor that symbol symbolic use of seven then gets repeated throughout the Bible. It's established in Genesis chapter one, and it gets repeated throughout the Bible. In Revelation, for example, he said, "And I beheld a lamb that had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Horns representing power, seven meaning." The Lamb, Jesus, has all power, eyes representing wisdom. He has seven eyes, all wisdom, all knowledge, omniscient, omnipotent. That is Jesus. Because like in today's world, you know, like lucky number seven and like triple seven. Like well, it probably comes from something like that. And the three is also repeated a lot in scripture. The rule of threes carries over even into marketing and advertising to this day. Uh, they'll say this, this, and this. Live, local, late-breaking news, you know, is the rule of threes. For some reason, our minds are, are uh, designed to handle that concept of the rule of threes. So anyway, he says, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, that's important because if you remember when God identified himself to Moses in the wilderness, and he said, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses like, who am I going to say? Which God, you know, which says this? He says, you tell him, I am sent you. And the, the word that's used there means, I am that I am. I'm, I don't have to um, define myself. I don't have to prove myself. I just, I am. I always have been. I always will be. I am. So Jesus uses that in the Greek uh, equivalent to that uh, often, especially in John's gospel, you see it, I am. And uh, so... When he says to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, and then says, me, I am, which he was probably speaking Aramaic, which sounded very similar to what God would have said to Moses in the wilderness. Uh, it probably really got under their skin because they knew what Jesus was intimating here. Another place where we see the eternality of Jesus, and he just says it of himself, he refers to the glory of he shared with the Father before the world began, saying in John chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So he was before the earth ever existed, before, before beginning, Jesus was already there. You know, it says, in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. And then John opens with, uh, in the beginning was the word. And that, 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 the verb there, was, is not in the beginning became the word, or in the beginning that word was initiated. The word was. Wherever you place beginning, he was. The word was. So Jesus is eternal. He's deity. And yet he became flesh. So Jesus is uniquely the Son of God in that he is God, and as such, he is the eternal Son of God. He's the Son of God in a way nobody else is. We, we will recognize ourselves to be the sons and daughters of God, but we're not a son of God in the way that Jesus is the Son of God. And I'll tell you why. But, you know, within the Mormon tradition, there's a sense in which we can be the Son of God exactly the same way Jesus was. And it's, it has to do with certain rituals and being a part of the Mormon church and all of this. But that's not true. Jesus is uniquely the Son of God in a way that we could never be, and that he's the eternally begotten Son, and he is full deity. So Jesus said, the Heavenly Father is our Father as well. But 
we are, we become the children of God by adoption into the family of God and thereby become heirs, as the Bible says, and join heirs with Jesus Christ. He is, in a sense, he's like he's our, as the eternally begotten son of God and we becoming adopted into the family of God by faith and grace. It's as though he is like our elder brother and he's, he's still God. He's still our God. He's our Lord, Savior, but there's a sense in which he's like the elder brother um, for us in the presence of God. He's our intercessor. So where does it say we're adopted? Well, Paul says this. He said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So if we're led by the Spirit, we're the sons of God. Are we the sons of God in the same way Jesus is? He said, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. So we're adopted into the family of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It's interesting that he says the Spirit himself. The, uh, the Greek word for spirit is actually in the neuter, meaning neither male nor female. Um, in the Old Testament, ruach, it's been argued that the word ruach is in the feminine gender. However, it depends on context. It can either be feminine or neuter. But the word for wind, spirit, or breath may be neuter, but the Bible defines the spirit as him, the spirit himself. It doesn't say itself. In fact, I think the King James Version right there actually says itself, which is a very bad translation. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And Jesus uses the word he, and I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter, paraclete. And when he comes, he will lead you into all truth. So clearly the spirit is not it. The spirit is a personality, the third person of the Godhead. And he goes on, he says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So um, in this world, and Jesus talks about that in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He said, I've overcome the world. Uh, Peter says, think it not strange, the fiery trial, which is the trial. Is some strange thing happening to you. It is normal that a fallen world would resist redeemed humanity. Because we bear the image of Christ. Satan hates Christ. And so he hates those that bear, or hates God, bear, hates those that bear the image of God. And would do his best to destroy even infants in the womb and children and anywhere along the way. Anybody that bears the image of God, you know, you, there's a word that has come along under Trump. It was called trigger. You hear that people say, oh, just talking about Trump triggers some people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I thought that was stupid until I realized I'm kind of triggered by some of the people on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> ah, I don't want to hear it. Um, <laughs> but Satan gets triggered when he sees redeemed humanity, when he's, especially when he sees us worshiping God and serving God. And um, so Jesus is the eternally begotten son of God. We are adopted sons and daughters of God. We're part of the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus uh, made a way for that to happen by giving himself. So we think about Father God then. And I know it's kind of, I'm covering this because it's in this third uh, article of the Declaration of Faith. Jesus calls uh, the Father his Father in heaven. He prays to the Father. He, he, he I, When he went to... Uh, you know, when Lazarus died, Jesus went out to the tomb, faced the, the tomb and said, Father, I know you hear me always, but so that they may know that, that this is your work. Uh, and then he prays out loud, but he calls to the Father. So Jesus also calls God your heavenly Father, or my, our, our heavenly Father in a couple places and says, you know, when we pray, we pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we pray to our Father. He said, your Father knows what you have need of before you ask. And then he says to ask. And he says, and whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so we have a heavenly Father. I grew up 
for much of my life without a father in my life. And, um, you know, it can be difficult um, when the other boys are there with their dads at the football game and their dads are whispering in the coach's ear saying, my son should be playing. And, you know, I don't have anybody advocating for me. I just had to make it on my own. And, um, but as I grew older and became a believer or rededicated my life to the Lord, um, you know, I began to appreciate that God has always been on my side. God has always been my advocate. God has always been in my corner. And I am what I am by the grace of God, as Paul said, because my father was believing in me. My heavenly father believed in me. And um, so he's made ways. And, and you know, I, I count it a privilege to, to pastor this church. It's not the biggest church in Georgia, but to me, it's, it's an awesome church. And I, I'm privileged to be able to pastor here for 23 years. To be able to write Sunday school lessons for the Church of God, which I've already done, and to become the editor and writer of Sunday school lessons. Growing up in West Virginia, looking at those adults on a dirt road church in Elk Lake, West Virginia, thinking that I would ever, in the remotest chance, be able to be able to write or edit that was like so far off. But God has a plan for our life. And Father God can get us where he wants us. Yeah, the Bible says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Uh, but God does this through Christ. And the Bible says in another place, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But the Spirit reveals them to us. The Father God says to the Spirit, um, tell Mark, I got a plan for his life. Hang in there. And then we, we let that spirit move in us and encourage us. And we walk in the spirit. And we walk by faith and not by sight, believing God to get us to where we need to be. Sometimes, you know, we have our own ideas about where we want to be. But the Bible says the spirit distributes spiritual gifts severally as he will. It's God's design for our life. And when we go with God on this, then, uh, then the outcome is always going to be much better than if we try to force our agenda onto God and then get mad when he doesn't bless it uh, as opposed to saying, Lord, whatsoever thou will. So our heavenly father knows what we need and will supply all our need when we seek him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, the father knows what you have need of, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So heavenly father knows what you need. The Bible talks about in one place, um, we think about the relationship between a father and a son. Uh, Jesus uses the example. He said, how many of you, if you have a son and your son asked for a fish, would you, would you give him a serpent? If he asked for bread, would you give him a stone? And I forget what the other one was. But he goes on and says, if you then, being evil, if you earthly fallen dads know how to give good things to your children, how much more? Does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts? And one says good gifts, one of the gospels, the other says the Holy Spirit to them that ask. And so he says, ask. <laughs> so now you've asked nothing yet. And he goes on, says, seek and ask, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So our father knows what we need. You know, as parents, we often, we, we know what our children need, sometimes before they even know what they need. We know what they're gonna need. <laughs> We know what they're going to be facing down the road because, you know, we we were youth one time and we remember the journey. And so the Heavenly Father knows what we need and we have to trust him and walk with him. So he's our Heavenly Father. Yes, ma'am. Can you pray for our um, Father? He's going, he, he, he is uh, doing bad, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Eric. Uh, Right. I want him to go to hell. Right. I want him to live what God wants him to do. Amen. I don't want him. I, I don't want him to go to hell and uh, burn into a fire. 
Yeah, you know, my dad left and was gone for 30 years of my life, and I looked for him and looked for him. Well, actually, it was before the Internet was out. When the Internet came around, I started searching on the Internet, but he, he never went on the Internet, yeah, I, so he hadn't. I came from a family that, uh, at night, I came from a family Save their souls because I don't want nobody to go to hell. Mm -hmm. Well, I say so that I didn't, I couldn't find my father, and the Lord helped me, so I prayed. I now, you know where yours is, but I know where my, I found my father after 30 years, and I had the opportunity to pray with him to ask him to give his heart to the Lord. So, if he can do that for me, he can do it for your father as well. So, we'll pray for Eric. Is his last name Fogg? I, that's a good guess, right? <laughs> I am a genius. Uh, in fact, let's just pause right now and pray for Eric that the Lord would touch him. Heavenly Father, Lord, you know where Eric is and you know what he needs. And God, I just pray, Lord, on behalf of his daughters here today, God, who desire for him to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you would reach into his life, bring someone into his life with the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, just touch him, Lord, that he might, Lord, surrender his life to you. And that, God, that they will have this wonderful hope. God, that they will, Lord, that when we're all called to glory, God, that he'll be there. That there'll be a glad reunion day. So, Lord, we pray for Eric. We just, we rebuke the devourer and pray, God, for Eric to find deliverance and salvation in the name of Jesus. And we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll keep praying for Eric, okay? So I wrote his name down here. So let's, So we've talked about the father of Jesus. And the, our declaration, that article goes on to say, we believe that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. So the heavenly father is the only father of Jesus. There was no earthly father. There's no, Joseph was not his earthly father. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, Joseph found out that Mary was with child. They were engaged or betrothed, which was almost like being married in that culture. You, could, you couldn't break it up except through a writ of divorcement. But they were committed to one another, but they had not um, had nuptials. They had not come together as man and wife at this point, but he found out that she was pregnant. And so he was thinking to put her away, as the King James says, privily to not make a spectacle of her. He could have made a big spectacle of her and shamed her and her family and everything else. But uh, Joseph, the Bible says, was a just man. And he was just going to say, hey, look, you know, obviously something's going on here. Let's just break it off and go our separate ways. But the Holy Spirit moved in him and gave him a dream. And in the dream, the angel told him, do not be afraid to take unto you Mary as your wife, for that which is she has conceived is of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and went on to say, you know, he's going to be the Savior. So um, Joseph knew he was not the earthly father of Jesus. Jesus knew it at a young age when Jesus was 12 years old and he was in the temple. I think Luke's gospel tells us about this. They couldn't find him. They'd gone to Jerusalem for one of the, the Passover. And they were in a caravan. They usually travel in caravans from Nazareth, which was probably, I think, three days or something like that journey. And... Um, they couldn't find Jesus. He's 12 years old. They go all the way back to Jerusalem. They find Jesus there, and he's talking with the teachers of the law, the scribes, the teachers, and uh, others. And they're astounded. The Bible says that he's questions because rabbis learn to ask questions. That was the whole thing. And you'll see Jesus almost often will answer questions with questions, and that's the way rabbis, that's the way they were taught to interact. And so Jesus was asking these profound questions. And Mary was like, she was frustrated, and she's like, why have you done this to your father and I? And, she, and Joseph was his adoptive father, and so it was, Joseph was from the lineage of David, and adoption back then was, I mean, it was like, they're, they're your own. But he wasn't physically the child of Joseph. But what did Jesus say? Do you remember what he said when she kind of confronted him on that? Don't you know, must, I must be about my father's business. And so I, Jesus understood, you know, he, he, he was respectful, I'm sure, to Joseph and all of that. And Joseph taught him to be a carpenter. And, uh, and I'm sure they had a wonderful relationship. But Jesus always understood that the heavenly father was 
was his father, the one who really had the ultimate authority over his life. And um, so he, he says in one place, I speak the words he gave me to speak. I do the deeds he gave me to do. And I must be about my father's business. So Mary was a virgin. She had never known a man before she became pregnant with Jesus. Now, Catholic Church teaches something called the perpetual virginity of Mary, saying that she never had relations with Joseph and that the children that are mentioned as the brothers and sisters of Jesus aren't hers. But no, nobody but the Catholic Church would believe that. The text itself doesn't leave that really up to question. Um, the Catholic Church also teaches something called Immaculate Conception. If you've heard that term, Immaculate Conception, it's not referring to Jesus, it's referring to Mary. They're saying, G that, so the idea is, well, if Jesus was born of Mary and Mary had sin, well, then Jesus must have had sin. So Mary must not have had sin, Immaculate Conception. But you see, that's just, it's called regression. So then what about her parents? So what do you have? What's called infinite regression. You just keep going back and back and back to nobody had sin. Well, obviously, everybody descended from Adam and Eve had sin. So the whole concept of immaculate conception of Mary being born without sin is not in the Bible. She calls Jesus her Savior in one place. In, in the, the Magnificent, the song she sung, she says she calls him her Lord. And I, I believe that she also refers to him as her Savior. And um, so, but Mary was the net. Now there's a dead man. So Mary was uh, a virgin, meaning she had never known a man before she became pregnant with Jesus. And by all accounts, she had normal relations with Joseph after he was born. The Holy Spirit was the agent of conception, causing her miraculously to produce the embryo that became the, the, uh, the child, Jesus. And the word became flesh. We say that Jesus was God incarnate. The word incarnate literally means incarnate, in flesh. Uh, carnate meat in the Latin for flesh. In, in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. And um, so here's the thing. Uh, Isaiah, which, that she was a virgin. Some say, you know, that word doesn't mean necessarily that she had never been with a man, although that's exactly what she says, seeing I have never been with a man. Uh, that it means just a maiden. Uh, but when you look in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, this is the prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So here's the deal, though. He says it's going to be a sign. If it just meant a young lady somewhere is going to have a baby, that's not a sign. Young ladies have babies all the time. But it's going to be a sign. It's going to be something that, that has the thumbprint of God on it. And what would that be? It's going to be a woman who's never known a man that's going to bear a child. And he will be Emmanuel God with us. So here was the interaction between Mary and the angel Gabriel. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the son and shall call his name Jesus. As we've talked about before, the name Jesus, Yeshua, means uh, Yahweh saves, I believe. It's similar to the, some would say exactly the same as the word, the name Joshua, Yahshua. And um, he will be great. And there are other people in the New Testament, by the way, at least one other person, uh, bar Jesus or son of Jesus, that's not this Jesus. And of course, in contemporary terms, there are a lot of uh, children named Jesus in Spanish, it's Jesus. <laughs> in fact, when a young man started coming to church, he said his name was Joseph. I said, well, that's a good name. I said, you need to marry a girl named Mary and have a child and name him Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look good on paper. <laughs> um, so I said, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. In Jesus, the Davidic covenant is fulfilled, which was that there would never cease to be a descendant of David up on the throne of Israel. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? In other words, she's not had relationships with a man. 
And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. That, that concept of overshadowing is sort of like that Shekinah, like the, like the cloud of God's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's like the, the glory of God will overshadow Mary and she'll conceive and God will cause this to happen. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And he goes on and says, and Elizabeth, your, aunt, your cousin who hadn't had a child, she's with child. And he says, with man it's impossible, but with God nothing will be impossible. And so Mary, um, in fact, becomes pregnant and gives birth to the infant Jesus. It's interesting when you look at some of the old artwork, uh, medieval artwork of Jesus, or even st whether it's statues or paintings, often you'll see it's like Jesus is like a, a little man. Like he's, he's born like totally knowing everything, and, but he's tiny, but he's got the shape of a man and a halo, always a halo. And, uh, but the Bible says he grew in stature and wisdom. It's like, well, when did he realize who he was? Well, by 12, obviously, he knew, right? And I would assume before that, but there was this uh, awareness of who he was. He was born without sin. You know, this concept of Jesus being born of woman and not of man goes back as far to, uh, to Genesis um, is it chapter 2 or 3, where he said, and, and the seed of woman shall crush the serpent's head. And um, says the seed of woman, as opposed normally it's the seed of man, but it says the seed of woman. And um, it's, that's often been referred to in theology or biblical studies as the proto evangelium the first message of the first good news that this offspring of the woman is going to defeat the serpent ultimately. And so... He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus was and is God in the flesh. He was fully God and fully human. Now, this concept of the divinity and the humanity of Jesus has caused, has resulted in a lot of theological debate, you know, especially early on in the early church. As I said, many people, the early church, found it easier to accept the deity of Jesus now, nowadays, you're going to hear people, that's the part they don't want to buy into. He never said he was God. Um, and yet he, he, he actually essentially says it without saying it uh, in a couple places. When, oh, yeah. Well, he said, yeah, that. And then references to, to Lord, uh, referring to him, that coming straight out of quotes from the Old Testament, where the word Lord there that's being repeated in the New Testament was Yahweh in the Old Testament. That's applied to Jesus in the New Testament, uh, where he forgives sin, where they say no one can forgive sin but but God, and Jesus says, all right, <laughs> your sins are forgiven, take up your bed and walk. And uh, he affirms his, his own deity. Another thing that you'll notice that affirms the deity of Jesus is that Jesus accepted and received worship, right? You read it over and over again. People came and they worshiped him. And they, you know, proscuneo means they, they prostrated, prost, it, I always get prostate and prostrate mixed up, <laughs> prostrated themselves before the Lord and, uh, and uh, use the R, I have to remember that, prostrated themselves before the Lord, which meant they bowed down at his feet and they worshiped him and they honored him. And it was, a, it was an act of uh, obedience and, and surrender and, and um, Jesus never told anybody not to do that. Not once. Not, never did he say, don't worship me. But uh, when the angel, I think in uh, Revelation, John <laughs> fell down to, like he was going to worship the angel, and the angel said, don't do this. <laughs> don't worship me. Uh, Satan tried to get Jesus to worship him, and Jesus said, oh, no, uh, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou worship. In essence, Jesus saying, uh, you're going to worship me, because one day every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm not going to worship you, but you will worship me. So Jesus received worship when, when he, Jesus himself said, only God can receive worship. Only God should receive worship. 
and not once did he ever rebuke someone for worshiping him. For him to receive worship was his way of saying, yeah, I'm God. Um, so he voluntarily, here's what I want to get to, this kenosis, it's from uh, Philippians chapter 2, it says, emptied himself. That word emptied is from the Greek word kenosis, and it means to, he emptied himself. He was God, fully God, but he emptied himself, making himself no reputation. And uh, the way it was explained, he didn't have his his deity stripped away from him so that he was no longer God, he was only man. He never ceased to be God. Otherwise, he could not have forgiven sins. He could not have received worship. He remained God, but he became human at the same time. And so there are what we call attributes of God, and depending on which theology book you use, they have different ways of explaining this. One of the first ones that I read talked about the communicable attributes and the incommunicable attributes. So communicable attributes are attributes of God that we share on a finite degree that God possesses an infinite degree. God loves infinitely. We can love. We share that attribute with God, but we love on a finite level. We don't have the ability to love infinitely. And you could think of many, many other kinds of things. God gives us wisdom, but we don't have infinite wisdom. But God has what's called incommunicable attributes. God is, for example, God is immutable. God doesn't change. I am the Lord. I change not. We change. Uh, the other thing is uh, God has all power. That's an incommunicable attribute. We don't have all power. We've been given power in the name of Jesus, but we are not omnipotent. So they're incommunicable attributes. So here's what we believe happened when it says Jesus emptied himself, that Jesus laid aside. These, so Jesus was not omnipresent is an incommunicable attribute. Omnipresent means you can be everywhere at the same time. God is a spirit. He, he's, he pervades the universe. He's in every molecule, every atom. God is everywhere. We're not. We're here, right here, right now. Jesus, when he became when he took on human flesh, was in one place at one time. And um, there's a sense in which he even uh, laid aside his omniscience because, remember he said, no man knows when the Son of Man is going to return, not even the Son at that time. I believe he knows now, but at that moment, he couldn't tell. He said, only God, the Father, knows this. So Jesus voluntarily. In other words, when he said, I will become human flesh and die for humanity, he said, I'm willing to lay aside these attributes of deity. Doesn't mean he ceased to have them. He laid aside the voluntary use of them. So he still had them, but he chose not to use them so that he could fully identify with us as human beings. It would be like um, if we were a billionaire, but we wanted to know what it was like to, to live as a homeless person. Well, you can't take your billion dollars into the streets and tents, but you could, I guess. But to do that, you have to leave the house, the big mansion. You have to, you know, you have to go out there and get in the mean streets to be one of those, to fully experience that reality. So Jesus did this so that he could identify with us, so that he could be uh, he could take on human flesh and then die in our place and become our sacrifice. So that's the, the kenotic uh, understanding, the kenosis, the emptying of himself. So Jesus came, why did he come? He said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to give his life. He lived to die. He was born to die to give his life. He came to seek and to save them that were lost. He came to die on the cross. That's why he came. It's like his, his mission wasn't a failure because he died on the cross. His mission was a success because he died on the cross and died for us. Philippians, here's the, the quote. It's called the Christ hymn from Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, well, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery. That word robbery means to grab and hold on to. He was God, but he was willing to lay aside the inter the independent use of the incommunicable attributes so uh, so that he could make of himself no reputation, take on the form of a bondservant, a slave, that's what the word means there, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so he had to take on full humanity. The Bible says in Hebrews that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And because of that, we can come boldly to the throne of grace to make our petitions known and, and obtain grace and mercy in time of need. So God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die for our sins and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus loved us so much. It's not that God forced it upon the son and Jesus went kicking and screaming. The Bible, he said, I, I lay my life down. He said, you know, uh, he talks about being a, a better than a friend. You know, a friend peradventure one might even lay down their life for a friend and yet Christ died for us and that while we were yet sinners he died for us he loved us that much it says I don't know the verse exactly but it says something about like dying one of the best ones you can do is die for a friend well that's the verse I'm talking about he said yeah. some might even die for a friend or give their life for a friend but Christ loved us so much while we were yet sinners while we were alienated we were hostile to God he died for us so that we could be brought back into relationship yeah. with him he paid a debt of sin that we owed. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's what the Bible says. And because of that, how do you pay the sin debt that we owe? In fact, we couldn't. God paid it for us. I remember a story, I don't know how good of an illustration it is, of a girl who came to traffic court. She had, I don't know, super speed or whatever it was, and she came to the, the traffic court, and the judge you know, she, she said, I'm guilty. And the judge, you know, pronounced her guilty and pronounced a fine on her, but she could not pay the fine. And so the judge got up, took off his robe because he was her dad and he paid the fine for her. And then he put his robe back on. Jesus, we were guilty. And Jesus paid the penalty for us because we didn't have it. And this is what Jesus has done. He was crucified. So Jesus was born. He was crucified. God was reconciling the world to himself through the death of Jesus. The world, you know, you hear about reconciliation. That's when two people don't get along. <laughs> and uh, because of sin, there was a, 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 a gulf, a, a chasm, uh, whatever you want to call it, a division between us and God. We were turned away from God. God was calling out to us, but we were turned away from God. The word repent means to turn around. It literally means to change your mind, but we get the idea if our mind changes, we turn around and we enter back into a relationship with God. And we do that through the grace of God that calls us back to him. And through Jesus, our sins were atoned. He is the atonement for our sin. That word atonement means, uh, you can kind of play on words, at one meant. We are made at one through Jesus. We're back into that relationship uh, in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so the death of Jesus was unlike any other death. Jesus became the perfect and final sacrifice for sin. There's power in the blood that brought us back into peace with God. And the cross was that decisive and final victory over Satan. So next week, Brother Register is going to um, pick up on the the, the buried, the raised from the dead. Brother Register has been to Israel as well. Went into, did you go into both of the empty tombs or just the one main? You went so, uh, you know, that my our, our guide convinced me, made me feel like for sure the garden tomb is the one, but I talked to a Jewish friend of mine, Jewish Christian friend, and he's, he feels like the one traditionally that has the longest history is the one that's in inside of near Jerusalem, nearer to Jerusalem. But anyway. Well, I want to uh, dismiss you with prayer. Thank you for being here. Continue to lift me up in prayer and continue to lift Eric up in prayer as well that God might touch his heart. All right. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to try to, Lord, understand who we are in Christ. We are forgiven. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are redeemed, reconciled, brought into right relationship with you, Father, through your son, Jesus Christ. So help us to walk in ways that honor you and that glorify you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>